Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I planted a garden this year, a vegetable garden, and I have a confession to make, which is that I have no idea how to garden. <laughs> Um, for years, my partner Brian and I have lived in rentals um, and we either had no space to garden or we didn't want to, you know, build raised beds only to move out for the next year. Um, and I am, I don't know, maybe not quite committed enough to a community garden, but mostly, mostly because I don't know how. Um, but two years ago, we moved into our first house that we have bought so that we intend to stay for some time. Um, so last year I planted my first garden and I have been joking about how um, I just kind of like put seedlings and seeds into the ground and then um, just kind of hope for the best. <laughs> like wait to see what happens. I, um, I always aspire to do more, you know, maybe set up my drip system or add fertilizer. Um, but I get, or even you know, get the right sort of like soil composition. But with apologies to Cheryl, I don't, I don't, I, I don't find it super interesting. I need to take one of her classes so that I can find it more interesting. Not that I, don't, I find the concept interesting. I just then I try, and I just it's not as interesting as I thought it would be. Anyway, but. What's amazing is that you put things in the soil and you walk away and then at the end of the season, what happens? It grows. It grows. Maybe not everything comes up. So gardening is a great way to learn like what, what are hardier plants than others. Um, our parsley, for example, kept coming and coming and coming and um, our kale lasted like deep into the winter, um, but there was only one tomato. But, but it was a big, beautiful heirloom tomato that I watched for a long time. And then I took it when it was ready, and I cut it, and I added salt, and I ate it when it was still warm from the sun. Is there I planted more tomatoes? <laughs> and this year I'm really gonna fertile and I'm figure it out. <laughs> so imagine my surprise when I opened the lectionary for this week and read our first parable in this text. The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and basically walk away. Go to sleep, and then the earth does what it does. The soil produces plants all of its own, and this sower doesn't come back until it's harvest time. <laughs> Sounds like I'm burning the right way. Um, this is the only time that this particular parable shows up in the Bible. Um, one commentary I read this week suggested that it's because it was so boring, because nothing happens except someone plants a seed and walks away. Um, <laughs> um, but it is kind of beautiful and amazing. The grower doesn't need to know what to do or how to do it. The earth produces. The soil produces. Maybe I am more interested in soil than I thought. We don't produce. And I don't know if you all have noticed um, but it has been a busy season here at Levin and Salt and Light. For those of you who are new to us, we have been doing a lot of things. We've been community organizing, we've been gardening, we've been participating in trainings, we had a big event here a, couple, a month and a half ago, we've been doing grant writing, we've been doing budgeting, we've been doing outreach and cooking, and we've been working really hard. Not so much the idea of planting a seed and walking away. At a recent meeting with our climate justice core team, 
we unveiled together, we shared with one another actually how tired we're feeling. How hard it feels like we've been pushing, forcing even. Pushing and pushing and months later, ending up in the same place maybe? Probably not, but sometimes it can feel that way. And yet the parable today assures us the earth produces, the soil produces. One might wonder, the spirit produces, the spirit generates, creates. It doesn't all have to rest here on our shoulders. What happens when we, as Pema Shodron says, when we soften into this? What happens when we allow ourselves to trust in this generative quality of creation? Is there another way that we can approach this? This actually reminded me a bit, when I started to think about this and reflect on this, about the characteristics and the traits of what is called white supremacy culture. If anybody, raise your hand if you've heard of this, perhaps. White supremacy culture is a concept by the um, scholars Tema Okun and Kenneth Jones, first published in 1999. And I managed to print out copies of this for the summer, but I can um, share it with folks or co free copies if people want to learn more about this. But the idea is that white supremacy culture is the widespread ideology based in the beliefs and the values and the norms and the standards of our communities and our towns, teaching us both overtly and covertly that whiteness holds value, and whiteness is value. And it's intersectional as well, meaning other oppressions reinforce and perpetuate this power. Now be careful. If you're feeling some feelings come up, maybe some defensiveness or some anger, some uncertainty, some questioning, that's okay. Whiteness isn't necessarily being white. Being white is not the culprit. It is in carrying out the traits in a way that is unexamined and reinforces hierarchical and violent patterns of power where white people largely benefit. The design of the system is ultimately to benefit white people and to reward anyone who lives and reinforces these characteristics. So I'm curious about some of these characteristics and this pushing and this pushing that we've been doing, this, this forcing. One of these characteristics is the idea that progress is bigger, progress is more, quantity over quality, that this is the best way to go about making change. Our cultural assumption is that the goal is always to be more, do more, get more, and that this is how we define success, only this. The assumption being that the goal is to grow, grow for the sake of growth. But what happens when we pay attention not to the growing for the sake of growth, but paying attention to how we want to grow? What relationships we hold? How we're paying attention to who we are in relationship with? When our goals aren't by the numbers of how many people, for example, did we talk to, how many one-to-ones did we have, but what was the quality of the conversations that we had. A second trait of white supremacy culture or characteristic is urgency. This idea 
that urgency reflects our habit of always needing to go faster, faster, faster. It's another way that we make choices about maybe time that decenters relationship and instead centers the doing and not the being. So again, what happens if when we feel that sense of urgency come in, we take a moment to pause and to wonder, is this really urgent? Or am I just feeling a sense of urgency? It is not that urgency in itself is bad or wrong. It's that we want to be paying attention and mindful to when, when these characteristics come into our being. And that we are using them appropriately and not decentering relationship. And so the final antidote that I want to think about, antidote to white supremacy culture, for example, that I want to think about today is this idea of the kingdom. We talked about this a little bit with the kids. When we think of kingdom, right, we think of thrones and crowns and power and hierarchy. And I wonder about what is liberating for each of us and our connection to the sacred and whether the word kingdom expresses that liberation. Instead, we can think about kingdom. Ada Maria Estasi Diaz is a mujerista, a womanist theologian, a Latina feminist theologian, who talks about this idea of kin, of family and relationship to reorient the way that we think about community, the community that we have together in God. It can emerge out of a space where love invites us into kinship, into a table together, and into relationship with each other. And today, we invite a new child into this kingdom, Mr. Emery, who's sitting there. Hi. <laughs> you. It's going to be you. <laughs> into this kingdom, into this loving family, grounded in the sacred source of being, of God. So this kingdom of God is like someone who would scatter seed and walk away. What is it like for us to think about this softness, this being together in our kingdomness, in familyness, in relationship, in love, trusting that the seeds that we plant, the children that we birth, bear fruit grow strong, grow tall in love, trusting in these things. What happens when we soften? What if we plant a seed and we walk away? So that's my, my question for you all today. I'm curious, so we have a tradition in this community um, of one-to-one -one conversations. We trust that the divine comes to all of us not only through one person standing here and telling, but by all of us discovering together through conversation. So what we will do is turn to a neighbor, perhaps someone you know or perhaps someone you don't, and we're gonna take about five minutes to talk about what would happen if we let go, if we let go of this need for control, if we lean into trust, the earth produces, God generates. So we'll take five minutes, turn to a neighbor, 
talk, it's optional. There's water and coffee out in the coffee in the sunroom. If that is your preference, there's a beautiful garden to walk, and I will call you all back in about five minutes. Thanks.